For most of its history, Japan has been one of the most isolated countries in the world. Because of its geography and distinct language and culture, Japan has been able to preserve its unique ways for thousands of years. And because of its strict anti-immigration policies, it has been an exception among the world's richest countries, having almost zero immigration and only a negligible amount of foreigners permanently living in Japan. But now, that is changing. For the first time in history, Japan is for forced to overturn this policy, and it has been quietly opening up to foreigners in recent years. And as numbers of immigrants coming to Japan are reaching record levels, these changes are quickly picking up pace. But why was Japan so closed off in the first place? Why is it now completely abandoning its anti-immigration policies? And why will this change Japan forever? But to understand why these changes are such a big deal, we need to explain where does Japan's tradition of resisting immigration come from? And how did it manage to remain culturally so distinctly unique compared with the rest of the world? And to do that, we need to go back all the way to the early 1600s. At that point, the world was going through its very early stages of globalization. European states were building up their colonial empires, venturing further and further into Asia, slowly increasing their influence in the region. Japan did not like it, and seeing the Western incursion as a critical threat to its own culture and security, it made a unique and unprecedented decision. Starting in 1633, Japan began a policy known as Sakoku that remained in place for the next two and a half centuries. Under the policy, any relations between Japan and Western countries were banned, and relations with neighbors like China and Korea were strictly limited. All foreigners were expelled from the country and banned from entering, and Japanese citizens were prohibited from leaving Japan, and those who left anyway were banned from ever coming back. For well over 200 years, Japan voluntarily entered an almost complete isolation, far longer and stricter than any other country in modern history. The legacy of this period is still debated in Japan, but often it's seen as sort of a golden era. While the rest of the world was suffering from colonization and conflict, Japan enjoyed two and a half centuries of stability, prosperity, and peace. Without wars and foreign influence, Japanese were free to dedicate their time to art and pleasure, giving rise to a concept of Japan as the floating world, separated from the standard human experience of conflicts and poverty, where time flows at a different, slower, and more peaceful pace. Now, eventually this blissful period ended, when the US Navy entered Japan with gunboats, and demanded that Japan opens up to foreign trade, or else, and in the next hundred years, Japan managed to rapidly evolve, catch up with the rest of the world, invade large parts of Asia, join Nazi Germany in World War II, and well, you know the rest. But even though the Sakaku policy ended a long time ago, according to many Japanese academics, the impact of these hundreds of years of isolation lasts until today. First, because of this very long timeout, Japan remained in many ways far more intact than any other country, with a culture and societal norms so distinct that it is much harder for people from outside to understand and accept them, making it much harder for any foreigner to fully adapt into the Japanese society. And second, despite Japan reintegrating into global politics and trade, in some ways it definitely kept some of that isolation well into the present day. It invests a lot of effort into preserving its culture as intact as possible, and part of that was always having one of the strictest immigration policies in the world. Since the end of the Second World War, getting an asylum, a citizenship, or any kind of long-term residence in Japan has been nearly impossible, and even getting a long-term work visa has always been extremely difficult, as Japan intentionally kept the number of foreigners, including skilled foreign workers, as close to zero as possible. In other words, for historic reasons, the Japanese society is objectively a difficult one for a foreigner to fully integrate in, and at the same time, the country has been actively trying to keep the numbers of foreigners as low as possible. The result of which is that Japan has had one of the lowest percentages of foreign-born population in the developed world. And while most wealthy countries became more and more diverse and reliant on immigration, Japan has remained an extremely homogenous society. But now it looks like that era is already over. 
But unlike Japan, when you're online, you're definitely not isolated from all the cyber threats to your privacy and safety. That's why it's a good idea to use a VPN, and that's why this video is sponsored by NordVPN, one of the most reliable VPN providers out there. NordVPN and its threat protection feature helps you to protect yourself from threats that you might encounter, like ransomware, phishing, or password attacks. You can use it to check suspicious links, generate and store unique passwords with the NordPass manager, and protect yourself from cyber attacks by hiding your IP address and encrypting your connection. And it goes beyond security as well. By using it to change your virtual location, NordVPN allows you to visit websites that might not be available in your location. And you can use it to access content on Netflix and other streaming services that might not be available in your region. You can start protecting your browsing with NordVPN for the price of one cup of Starbucks a month by going to the link nordvpn.com slash dom and using my unique promo code dom, you can enjoy one bonus month on top of a two-year plan with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So go to nordvpn.com slash dom or click the link in the description to start. And now, back to the video. For decades, Japan's resistance to immigration allowed it to maintain its distinct character. But in recent decades, what was long considered an advantage started to become more and more problematic. Here's what changed. In the decades after World War II, Japan went through one of the most incredible economic developments in history. Despite losing a world war, pretty soon after, Japan managed to recover, and from the 1950s onwards, it started what became known as the Japanese economic miracle. But this economic boom was accompanied by a massive drop in fertility rates, meaning that Japanese were not having enough babies, and the fertility rates have kept decreasing ever since. And the consequence became visible very soon. The growth of Japan's population, which helped fuel the economic growth during the Japanese miracle, started slowing down, then stopped completely, and in the past 10 years, Japan's population has actually started to shrink. And this is a big problem. Japan's economy has been already stagnating for a long time, and the population crisis is making it a lot worse. With a decreasing population, it becomes much harder to achieve economic growth, as you have both less workers and less consumers. And it's not just that Japan's population is shrinking, but it's also aging, which means that there will be less workers, but more elderly people, economically dependent on pensions from the state, but there won't be enough economically active people to pay for those pensions. And this is still just starting. In the next 50 years, Japan is predicted to lose a one-third of its population, and that will have devastating effects on its economy. Now, Japan is by far not the only country to be dealing with this. There is not a single rich developed country, whether in Europe or Asia, that would have fertility rates high enough to at least sustain their population level, let alone increase increase it. And so far, no country has been particularly successful at convincing their citizens to have more kids. And so instead, the way for the rich western countries to prevent a population collapse has been increased immigration. It might not be always popular, and it brings its own set of issues, but for the west, immigration has become an economic necessity. It's what keeps their populations, numbers of workers, and economies growing. And without it, an economic growth would be much, much more difficult. But here's the problem for Japan. Not only that it has the oldest and fastest aging population, but unlike other countries, it doesn't have any immigration that could help it to mitigate some of these issues. Which means that the Japanese population crisis and economic problems are much harder to deal with. And so, for a while now, Japan has been quietly reversing this decade-old policy of zero immigration and implementing more and more policies that take Japan in the opposite way. Policies that are, in the end, likely to change Japan forever. Since 2013, Japan started to bring in hundreds of thousands of immigrants, and four years ago, it launched a historic immigration reform. It allowed Japan to not only bring hundreds of thousands of more foreign workers, but even more importantly, for the first time in history, those foreign workers that are highly skilled will be allowed to stay in Japan indefinitely, with the expectation that many of them will choose to do so. 
And since then, Japan has been expanding the numbers of foreign workers that are brought into the country almost every year. The result is that during the past decade, the reality behind the image of Japan as a homogenous and closed off society has been quickly changing, as it is becoming more and more diverse and multicultural, especially in the big cities. Since 1990, the number of foreigners living in Japan tripled, reaching a historic record of 3 million at the end of 2022, with a million people coming in just since 2015 and the numbers are still going up. In 2070, the government expects that at least 10% of Japan's population will be foreign-born, which means that Japan will have a higher share of foreign nationals than countries like the UK have today. Perhaps surprisingly, unlike in the West, there hasn't really been any sort of a populist backlash against this historic change. According to surveys, almost 70% of Japanese think that it's good that the immigrants are coming in most likely because they are aware of how big are the problems that Japan is facing and how much the country needs the immigrants to deal with them. But even though this is an economic necessity, these reforms will inevitably change Japan for good. In places like Tokyo, every 10th person in their 20s is already a foreigner. And as Japan will become more and more cosmopolitan and diverse, these changes will continue to be more and more visible transforming Japan in a way similar to how Europe has transformed in the past decades. In a sense, one chapter of Japanese history is ending, and a new Japan is just being born.